i.e. not maths, or not a world that we've created ourselves, where we don't quite know everything, whereas deductive reasoning makes an assumption that we know everything. Now, in these um, police procedurals and this kind of stuff, they're making some big assertions about the confidence with which they have some of these deductions, about some of the data that they have. So, for instance, you know, they might, might, might make a deduction that it's uh, Colonel Crom in the living room with a um, knife, if you ever know play. Who's played Cluedo? Who's heard of Cluedo? Somebody, oh, yeah. Cluedo, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, detective game that uh, is supposed to be more like a kind of Poirot <coughs> type mansion experience where, you know, sort of trying to find out who's doing Okay, and who's done the murder? And you can only do that by having these facts, and these facts are close, close to, you know, we, we, the facts are the facts. Okay, that's why it's maybe deductive reasoning is kind of okay, but not so good, not so well used in <coughs> empirical science. And UX and HCI is empirical science, right? So this is what we're going to do. Therefore, the conclusion must be true provided that the premises, the premise, premises, premise, come on. The premise is true. Okay, so the premise has to be true. If the premise isn't true, it all goes to pieces. So in this context, herbivores only eat plant matter. Is that premise correct? No. No. Why not? Because the plant goes on the plant. Because the plant goes on the plant. Yeah. And what other more malign way of knowing that authority is malign? I should mention it. Mad cow. Mad cow, right? So they're eating, they're eating, you know, if we as humans have decided that they're going to uh, eat uh, bits of pelletized, they're going to be cannibalistic, they eat bits of pelletized, you know, uh, animal, pelletized cow, then they're not herbivores, no matter how much. So that premise fails. In the closed world, it's logically correct, but it's not in the open world, which would screw it up. Technically, I also don't know whether we screwed it up because if you gene splice a fish gene to a tomato to make it more resistant to cold temperatures, which has been done, then is that a vegetable or a vegetable? No, anyway, there we go. Note that you can say, therefore, all cows are vegetables because food also contains, you can't, you could not say, all cows only vegetables only because. All right, so this is the scientific method. Who's, known, who's heard of the scientific method? Being that you're all computer scientists, who's heard of the scientific method? So you guys haven't heard of the scientific method, is that what you're saying on that table? You've never, you don't know what science is? No idea. You're in the computer science, what the hell is science? What? Science? Okay. So what does the scientific method tell us? Don't worry on board, just tell me when you learn on board. What do you think it's mostly predicated on? Empirical science, shall we say, yes. Right. Forming hypotheses and then testing them by making observations. Yeah, so we form hypotheses, we conduct experiments, and we test those hypotheses by the observational data we spot we get back from those experiments. Simple as that. Now, this can change. It's very simple. It's very basic and very powerful. These hypotheses have to be testable. So they have to come out of <coughs> the test. They have to be testable. And secondly, the hypotheses doesn't necessarily have to be the first thing because it kind of isn't. Okay, so the first thing is we are interested in something. And then we try and investigate a bit more, think about it. And only after the time we form these kind of the thing about finding the thing about these hypotheses is that we we might allow those hypotheses to emerge for us, and this is called grounded theory. Okay, so grounded theory allows us to go into a situation which we're interested in, but not yet have any hypotheses to test, but to do some data collection, data capture, and then allow us to understand what the hypotheses and choose. Oh, and that's kind of the data collection stuff we've been talking about before. There's quite a big overlap between the 
data collection, which we were talking about, so just from observation and focus groups and the evaluation too. So it's quite a, quite a big overlap. Okay, so we can see that this is the general idea that you've got these hypotheses, you have experimental procedures, you get data out, and then you have findings. The difference is that while this looks correct, there's pretty much wherever there's an arrow, there's a point where we can fail. Okay? Because we can, for instance, not have hypotheses that are well formed, that are testable. Okay, so I'm up, so I could say, what's the problem with me saying <coughs> this chair it could be orange? Is that a testable hypothesis? Do you get a right or a wrong answer from that? It's not testable. You could, it could be orange. It could not be orange. It doesn't matter. You can't be orange. Yeah, it could be. Um, um, also, secondly, if I say this chair is orange, is that testable? Huh? Am I stating the fact? Is this chair, this chair is orange? That's my hypothesis, right? So could I disprove that this chair is orange? The church is there to get in on people's views of colour, because I see that chair as red. Right, so you say that chair is red, so yeah, it's not testable. So that's what I'm saying, it isn't testable, because orange is this, I don't know, this, this <coughs> is orange. So what I might say is, is this chair, and then you can give you a uh, reflected, because this chair might change colour based on natural light. This looks different to me to that one over there, which is in the non natural light. Okay? So I could then give you an RGB value to say, is this chair this RGB value? Okay, which gets more testable because the answer will come back yes or no. Is this chair this RGB value within 10% error rate? Then you can test it. <coughs> so you have to be specific. So you might have a problem with the hypothesis. The experimental procedure might be incorrectly conducted because you might have things like experimental bias, guinea pig bias. We might we might know that you know we might we might know as experimenters the answer we want, and we might in some way convey that to participants who will agree with us because we can't ever be unbiased. Okay? The data, we might analyze the data in a different way. We might analyze the data to maximize our ability to um, to, to get an outcome we want. As an academic, if I publish a piece of work that, where I go through a whole lot of stuff and then it turns out my results are all crap, how likely do you think it is I'm going to get that paper published? Yeah, it's not. Okay. Unlikely. At this point, yes. It's likely because they can't more people in general. Well, yeah. It's pretty, it's, so, you can know, get the Spanish paper published and have all these papers supporting it. That's right. So you can actually get that published somewhere. So that's the hypothesis, but uh, so you can actually get it published. But I, but, but I'm using my scientific catch-all, which is all things being equal. You'll notice in scientists, all things being equal means that you know all things being equal is the true of the earth. Right? You've got gravity that we've got. We travel in the world correct way through space. Okay? So that's what those things might change the outcome of the experiment. Right? So all things being equal. But yes. You're right, we could get things published in crappy, horrible journals, but do I want to do that? Because my salary is, directly, is pretty much directly related to my age index. So the number of people who cite me and the number of citations I've got for my work enables me to get promoted to my value. So I could just go, so I could get published in some crappy old place. Nobody would cite me, nobody would ever see it, but it wouldn't make any difference to my career prospects. The other thing is that the science is all about dissemination. So science builds one on the next. We stand on the shoulders of giants, right? That's what people have said before. So if we haven't got that dissemination, if we haven't, if we haven't disseminated our work, look at who's. Show me, show me, show me the writing there, because I'll tell you if we shall. 
and they wouldn't get to the place to get. Not really get they did, but they certainly made some of the scientists under the time because other people want to believe it to be true, so they're happy to believe it to be the science. Show me the citations that get to the citations. Because otherwise, the number is what I don't want to be. That's the case. Yeah. Show me the data. This is how these things have survived. No, what, what's, what's survived is pop psychology. You go down to the net, that's our citation. Okay, so pop net, net. If somebody likes to read something, read them, and then write something on the net, and then everybody keeps, if you like, citing on the net, that's not. Is this all citing the gamification? Yes. Yes, it is. Citation and age index is a gamification rule on our little you know, scale. Well, I mean, there's a reward at the end. It's called keeping the job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's lots of places for failure at all these points. Okay, so that's what we have to be careful about when you're doing the work. <coughs> So, let's have an inductive example. Who skipped it? Well, no, I'm going to just skip ahead with this. Who's heard of. Who's heard of the black swan? Two? Okay. So, who wants to tell me about the black swan? You put your hand up first. So, you knew the super happy to do it. Uh, it's basically when an event you can't predict. Okay. 
So there's many debates regarding the question of whether inductive reasoning leads to truth. And it depends what you mean by truth. So what do we mean by truth? What do we think science is? What does science create? Hmm? Questions? Questions? Yeah? It creates models of our world. Yeah, it creates models which are approximations of how our world works so that it can better predict the living live in that world. Okay? But we're not saying that nobody in science is saying this is absolute truth because that means that nothing will ever be able to change in science and we know that we don't know very often things will change. Okay? So yeah, it's a model. So therefore, truth is a bit of a strange thing to be talking about. The reason why people talk about science giving truth is because they need to, in some way, if you're a scientist, you need to in some way counteract the idea about belief that science, because people who would believe things would then say, well, science is no different to uh, Satanism. You know, we believe in some people believe in Satan and Satanism, which I don't know if that's what you mean. Well, uh, or something like that. And, and science is a belief that's no, you know, unless you can make it strong and hard truths. Well, that's not the way that science works. Why? And science is there to create models. Okay. In the UX domain, we use <coughs> mathematical statistical methods. Does anybody get scared when they see this word? I do. Statistical methods. Statistical methods can tell us anything pretty much. We, can, you know, we use the wrong ones and it will tell us wrong stuff. We use the right ones and it will tell us correct stuff. The thing about statistics is that we have to design the experiments correctly and we have to want the correct answer. If we want to manipulate the answer, it can be done. Oftentimes we can do it. It won't affect the truth of the reality. So we can manipulate the statistics, but those statistics won't make the world work like the statistics. It can just be a lie. Okay? So if you're going to put your data out there, you're going to put your application out there, you're going to try and build an application, messing with the statistics to make it suit what your manager wants won't make the actual application not fail will just make it be a shock to your manager when it does fail, and then you'll be sad. It's best to not do that. It's best to make sure that the stats are as good as you can get them. Okay. And even then, you might be, you know, you might get it wrong. Why might you get it wrong? Is there only 100% in empirical science? No. We can almost disprove the hypothesis just with one one counterexample, but we can never we can never prove it because we can't test every possibility that it is possible. Okay. So therefore we can only support it. Just like our white swan principle. We support the white principle it's super complicated because everything up to that point, every time we try and do something, everything up to that point suggests that the swans were white. Okay. We make statistical methods so we can generalize the results to a wider population. So if we've got uh, the standard did we know what the hell is that? Strange. <laughs> Strange fiction. Anyway. Um, so for instance, generalization. If we have a population and we want to know the mean of that population. Is the mean of that population a statistic? Okay. It is, it is. It's actually not. And the reason why it's not is because it's a call that the parameter. Because it's a population. Statistics talk to us, statistics allow us to talk about a sample in relation to the population being that the population is too big to get the parameter from. If we've done a census of everybody in the UK, that's the population, and there's no statistics to run on that. You run the parameters. Okay? You don't need to extrapolate those to the wider population, because the population is the population. That's what you've done. So the first thing is, define your population correctly. Your population might be younger users to the age of 30. It might be older users to the 
why do old school people call them subjects, call them subject variables and participant, and I call them no people with positive guess? Well, yeah, it's like they're being loved, like they're being loved. It comes from, we'll see this, we'll get more to this in the ethics part, but in the old days, subjects are people who know us. So as experimental scientists, which you all are at the head of the kind of education, and having an education from a good place, and being able to look down on these nasty, horrible, woo, horrible people that you have to talk to. And those are your subjects, right? They're not participants altogether in the trial, in the study. The reason why that's a problem, yes? Yes, I mean, uh, uh, so animal, I'm not saying that they're not normally only the cool subject yet, but they're not really subject because 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 they're not really So they're <laughs> objects, they become objects. So, subjects. The other thing about subjects is that, they'll, that if you're thinking, if you have the mindset that this is a subject, then that subject also will have the mindset that they're a subject, and they'll give you the answer you want, not the answer that is correct. Okay? So that means your trial, if I'm thinking this thing up, your trial might be internally valid, might have a high internal validity, but it won't be externally valid because you've influenced and biased the, the actual trial. Yeah? It's okay. Now, we also have independent variables, the things we manipulate, and dependent variables, the things we measure. Okay? So this is the thing we manipulate, this is the thing we measure. Because this is dependent on the, the experience of the independent variables. Now, we also have, with regard to this dependent variable, we have different kinds of measurement. This is important because it means that you can only apply certain statistical tests based on what you choose, and it also is important because that means that the confidence with which you can make a prediction about something is lessened from the top to the bottom. So this is most highly confident, and that is the lowest these also sometimes have different names. But we normally have um, a nominal or a categorical variable. And this, this, there's a big debate about this. So if you've got a life art sale, there's a big debate between whether that's a nominal or an ordinal variable. So who's done life art scales? One. No? Okay, well, we'll get to that. But scales in questionnaires, etc. Get to that. There's a difference between the nominal and the ordinal variable. There's a big bunch up now between that ordinal is supposed to give you a better level of confidence for people to say, well, actually, you've got to say it's nominal because people, when they're, when they're doing this, when they're filling out these questionnaires, think of it as categories, not as this kind of ordinal aspect. Okay. We've also got interval variable and we've also got ratio variable. The ratio variable is better because it's got a zero. Okay, so it's like a standard integer. Okay. We then have two different types of hypotheses. We've got the null hypothesis and we've got the hypothesis. The hypothesis, the null hypothesis isn't the alternate of the hypothesis. It just says, with, a, with all hypotheses and with all statistical tests, what you're trying to do is, is not decide on whether something is more significant You'll hear this term a lot, and that's not what it means. Okay? Significance doesn't mean, in this kind of work, in statistical work, doesn't mean the same as we might think of it does in the real world. So it might be that <coughs> one is, more, is less significant than 20. You, that's a subjective decision. You have to make that decision based on what you're actually measuring. It's more, it's more significant if the scale is from 1 to 20 and is different between 1 and 20. But it's not very significant if, the, if it's between 1 and 6 million and the difference is 20. That's not a significant difference. So in, in, in stats, significance doesn't mean that. What it means is this. Null hypothesis dictates that there is no difference between 2 
conditions beyond chance, beyond random chance. So if it's significant, if you've got significance, then it means that the differences between them are not due to random chance. The null hypothesis says, ah, eh, it's just random chance, it doesn't matter. But the actual fact that you've got a hypothesis says that it's due to the hypothesis, and that is not chancy. Okay? There's no random chance in that. It's all very common. Okay. We also have to be strong and weak. We've talked about hypotheses. So a weak hypothesis might be something that's difficult to test. That's very easy to, it's difficult to test, but it's very easy to get whatever answer you like from it. A strong hypothesis is very brittle. But the good point is that if you keep throwing things, trying to disprove the strong hypothesis, it's very brittle, but it never breaks. You can be damn sure it's right. Okay? But if it's weak, then you can be throwing things at it and it's always right, but it's weak. It's not brittle. Okay? It's very flexible, if you like. So yeah, let's, let's use the same metaphor. It's very flexible. So therefore, if it's very flexible, anything's going to be okay. And it's going to give you a wrong answer. Alright. Nothing to prove, we've already said that. Remember, for next week, come on. In three weeks' time, we'll be sitting there. Over Easter, eating your chocolate eggs, hanging out, face covered in you know, Easter egg envelopes. Um, after Easter, we'll have the next chapter, you need to ask questions, you need to get prepped out for the discussion topic, which is in week. Week? Nine! Nine! Hooray! And what week is this week? Eight. Eight. So the Wednesday you get back, you need to get it submitted. Don't get back and think, oh, I've got two weeks. Job's a good one. Get back and submit. In fact, do it now. Submit before you go, and then you can just sit around on, on at Easter doing your revision, eating the chocolate eggs, go down and think about it. Yes. Okay, um, still got a surgery on the Wednesday if I get to you, so if you need any help, you can see me, and I'll see you in.